So today I will try to show you how you can use the tools you know to basically have them compute on bigger amounts of data. And first, a couple of words about me. I'm, I'm a data lover, study here in Vienna, and did several interesting projects. And currently, I'm employed by T-Mobile Austria, working on the master's thesis with machine learning and fraud detection problems. By the way, we are hiring. If someone is interested, drop me a line. So when you start, for example, in R, as we are doing here, and you want to parallelize computation, you first need to know that normally the computation is single-threaded in R. So if you write a loop like this one, this will be really slow. There exist additional packages you can use to allow for um, parallelization on a single computer, and there are other packages which allow you to spin up a small cluster. But as you will notice when you use these packages, um, sooner or later you will basically need to focus on the communication of these machines and can no longer focus on the business problem basically solving your statistical challenge or your data science problem. And this is by tools like Hadoop, the Born, and to handle these larger amounts of data because more compute resources are required. Probably a lot of you know this marketing slide about all the problems of big data and the nice things and the kinds of big data, but what I want you to take away from it is that there are several types of big data, but the most important thing is don't do big data if you don't have to. Usually it's easier to buy a computer for, with a lot of RAM, for example, a couple of terabytes and continue analytics there than just starting to build a whole cluster of Hadoop machines and dumping some data into it. It is possible and quite likely that after you have extracted features and basically compressed the data into a usable format from the raw and unstructured data, that it again fits nicely into your tool of choice, for example, R, and this allows you to compute a lot easier. And then there's the case that you basically are lost and have to go into Hadoop way, but then again, the tools I will show you later on will allow you to basically perform easy fitting of models on large quantities of data. And what I learned recently is that for enterprises, Hadoop often means starting out new, getting a new team, and they will basically go through all the departments of enterprise and collect the data. And then a couple of gigabytes of data is considered baked data because you can do smart things and AI with it. And there's fast data. So, um, yeah, this is the first elephant in Vienna, and I <coughs> hope some of you seem to know him quite well. So Hadoop initially uh, was using the MapReduce paradigm, and I will show you how this works later on. But the thing is, it was basically allowing you to focus on your business logic, but it was a little bit slow because it was writing all the intermediate data to disk. And it was introducing you to basically a distributed system where guarantees that data might be sorted will no longer hold. Because as you see, data will traverse a lot of network connections. So how does NetProduce work? Let's use a simple example. You can imagine a couple of documents. Some of them might be larger and you will have a lot, a huge quantity of documents. You'll basically map them to some tokenized form in this case, we're doing a simple word count. So for example, for each unique word, we will map them to a token of one, and then later on reduce them. This is an easy problem because it's associative and commutative. So basically, you can exploit a lot of nice properties of distributing the calculation of this problem. <laughs> and this nature of the problem is important to be actually useful for Hadoop. And even better, if it's commutative, basically you can use declarative SQL, like some engines allow you, to do it nowadays, and when it's, the engine itself can optimize the execution graph of the queries. And what you should take away is that the ordering of operations is no longer guaranteed because the data is traversing the network. The basis for all of this is a distributed file system where all the computers can read data from, and nowadays and one should add that we have a common resource scheduling mechanism which allows you to distribute resources evenly. But a regular, or let's call it Java and old style Hadoop program, consisted first of a Java project, a lot of lines of code, and it was, as I said, basically forcing you to write intermediate steps of the process 
into, into local file system, which means it was slow. Spark comes to a rescue, yeah, rescue in that case because it allows you to basically focus on the fun part. It requires a lot less lines of code and integrates well with several programming languages and is well suited for this, these problems because it allows for easy machine learning because the data is kept in memory and you can iterate there, for example, for graph problems very well. The concept of Spark is that the data is kept in memory and spilled to disk only if needed and it builds a basically graph of operations which will be uh, performed one after the other and it will have these operations executed in a resilient manner. So even if a couple of workers die, it will successfully complete the whole job. Hi, nice to meet you. So, <laughs> um, the, the additional Spark offers some nice properties. It's really terse, you don't need to write a lot of code, and the data sets are resilient, as mentioned. But they're also immutable, and allow you to use um, operations, with, for example, which were introduced in the Java language in Java 8 for mapping, filtering, these functional programming styles, to use these constructs in a distributed environment and offers other um, verbs like reduce or collect or count to basically start to trigger this operational graph. The word count I explained to you before can be, instead of programming 90 lines of Java MapReduce code in a couple of, let's say, two lines, if you don't add the line breaks for better readability. And it's nice because it has an integrated REPL, so you can really play with the data flow and understand what's going on. Um, as Spark matured, several components were built on top of Spark. So if you go back one slide, you see that still you need to know a certain type of logic how to handle the data. <coughs> Most of the people or analysts no SQL already, which is a declarative language, and they built it right into Spark. So it, it's more accessible to a huge amount of people. And other uh, interesting projects, especially for machine learning and so on, were added. The part which is most interesting to, for us here today is all these integrations Spark offers, because, yeah, you can actually ask some questions there, but it's something Google is added. Um, the integrations are great because Spark allows you to use any kind of programming language you're probably using in a statistical context to connect to your compute resources and to most of basically all your data sources. So for example, if you're using R, you might not have a possibility to read Hadoop data formats like Parquet or Org easily, but with a Spark in between, you can just get them into a local data frame if it fits into memory, or you can use Spark to pre-process the data and how to do this, I will show you in the next couple of slides. So, in R, there is a tidy universe. So, are there people using the tidy universe when they're using R for statistical analytics? Yeah. So, most of the people, I think, who raised their hand before, are actually using the tidy universe for doing analytics. Um, one thing which is so great about the tidy universe is that other co-workers can easily pick the language up and that there's a package called DiplyR, which allows you to write a language, a language you see basically here, and it's really easy to read, and it allows you to exchange the execution backend. So you can keep writing this language, but instead of operating on the local, in memory, R data frame, which might be constrained to memory issues, you can just switch the execution backend and use, for example, a Postgres or MySQL database, or as I will show you, in the next couple of minutes, a distributed Hadoop data store like Spark. Spark offers a couple of possibilities to integrate R, and the one I would recommend most is Sparklia, because it's really easy to get started. You can just install it from CRAN, and if you're in an enterprise environment, it allows you to use the Livy server, which basically means that you could access Spark from outside of a cluster via a RESTful API, which means all your administrators will be happy. Um, Spark R is the basic package which comes built into Spark if you build Spark with R support, but is less easy to obtain and might require a custom build of Spark. And you have a possibility to use a piping, but I would not recommend it for stability reasons. Um, before we actually dive into a demo, let's look at the architecture. It's a little bit not sharp. Anyway, so 
you start your R session locally and you will tell Spark to do a job for you, which means the commands, maybe some data will traverse over to Spark. It will fan out your computation to all these workers and will, will execute your R code locally. As you can see, with each of these arrows and the ones between here, serialization occurs, which might mean that you lose some performance, but also that you will get nested exceptions, which might be harder to debug. So I want to demo you now how to perform some uh, yeah, simple tasks and how to get started. So initially you basically need to install a package and you can just load them like any normal R package. You install <coughs> Spark and then you connect to Spark. And if you use any recent version of R Studio, you will see in the top right corner that now you can basically access it from the drop down uh, window and you just can just click to connect. Um, here in our case, I would start a local Spark server, but you usually would connect to your cluster. So when Spark is running, we need to wait a couple of seconds for actually having it start up. We can show the web interface, and the web interface of Spark is fairly nice compared to what other tools offer, because it shows you the exact um, SQL you are running in a really nice graphical uh, fashion. So here we see the user interface and it, we have already executed some SQL, nothing too complex. But these plans, which might grow really large for some analytical SQL queries, I outlined on the top here in a nice uh, user interface. Maybe we can look at this later on. And you will need these if you want to debug or performance optimize your jobs. <coughs> so when you have data in R, you can just copy it over to Spark. Let's copy a couple of data frames over. Or you can write something to a CSV file, or you probably have like a huge amount of CSV files, and you can read them into R. R is uh, into Spark, I mean. And Spark offers, by its JVM, a really high performance uh, mechanism to read data into R. The standard packages of R are often really slow. So this could be interesting for you anyway, even if you're not interested in the distributed computation. So now we should have a couple of tables loaded into Spark. And you will see that they show up on the right-hand side. And we can, like any normal data frame, just drop down and see what the columns are available to us, which is a neat integration here. But we can also access the tables on the command line. But we're not they do not look that pretty. So anyone familiar with the Diply R language will notice uh, at the, that this basically just does not represent any uh, change. You can just execute it and it'll, it will work and output some table, which is really great. So your currently staff trained on R can just continue using the same tool. And even more complex queries like the one here are possible. Note that in this case, we're using a collect statement at the very end, and we basically filter the data, which is really big, at least we can assume that it's big, before. So now the data will fit into the local memory. After running the collect statement, the data is now regular R data frame, and we can just apply regular R commands to it. For example, we can plot it. So let's make a nice plot. And I think this is something which is the great thing about R, the plotting, which is superior to what Python currently offers on PySpark. <coughs> if you're a fan of plain SQL, because you're a database guy, you can use SQL as well. It just works. And you don't have deeply R generate that for you on the fly. But I think you're here to learn about the machine learning possibilities. And as mentioned before, there might be this type of big data which requires you to perform distributed model fitting. So Spark offers certain types of models, for example, a linear regression model or a random forest or trees, and you can just invoke them and the data will be, uh, will be basically accessed by Spark distributedly and the model will be filled in, fitted in distributed fashion. And then you can get back the results. So let's copy some more data to our uh, Spark. We can partition the data into train and test data set. 
and now we fit the model. The language, the, the, like it, it's a little bit different for notation from the standard linear model, but it should be fairly easy to learn if you want to try that. Nice thing is, it will run a little bit, and then we can go for the summary function, which gives a nice summary, actually the same one like we're used to seeing from the normal linear model <coughs> in R. If you go back to the Spark user interface, we shall, now should see that a lot of queries were run. And for example, here is something which is showing the head of a data frame as before. And there should be some more interesting ones, maybe this one. There you see that it's nicely visualized what is going on. And it is, let's zoom in a bit, but not back. And you will see the counts. Okay. Yeah, you can see it from the back. So it will show you the counts here, how much data is actually processed, which can be really helpful when you try to optimize. But the most uh, powerful possibilities are basically to not just use Spark for ETL and Spark's machine learning, because these models are, let's call it, rather simple. You might, or you probably have, and some R code, which is doing some amazing things, but you don't have the compute power on a single computer to basically use these amazing things on all your data. And this is what user-defined functions are for. You can use basically Spark to ship your R code to all these worker nodes, and Spark will then execute, as outlined in the architecture slide before, um, yeah, you saw it, um, will execute a local R process on these workers and will run your code there and distribute it. So for example, let's execute a random function here with kjitter. It's not so useful. And you see it just works. Or for example, if we want to get an additional column uh, computed from some first column, we can just add it to the data frame. But what is more interesting are uh, user-defined aggregate functions. You probably all know SQL and what the group by aggregation does. Usually you would aggregate, for example, by account, sum or mean. And user-defined aggregate functions are custom ways to aggregate these groups. In the normal Hadoop world, you have to implement these in Java, and they require several lines of code, and are often a little bit complex to understand. Here in R, you can just apply them with a couple of lines of code. So if you have a data set over in our cluster, we basically say, let's fit our function. In this case, this is a linear model of R, you all know. But as the output of a linear model is not in a tabular format, but some random unstructured um, objects, we basically use an additional package, which will tidy the output and output us a tabular format with all the columns or the, all the values which are outputted and of interest <coughs> to us here. So now we can basically run a linear model for all customer groups in our data set and perform some fancy anomaly detection or some fancy prediction. And it should work really fine. <coughs> the downside is, for this to work, you need to have R installed on all the worker nodes. Some cluster administrators might have some objections there if you learn it on a local um, Spark cluster. To finish off with the demo, you can just shut Spark down. And as you have seen, it might be really easy to get started with Spark, a little bit too easy when you want to run it on a real job with a lot of data, you will need to configure Spark. And I'm just searching for oops, the configuration. So you basically need to configure Spark at the startup with additional memory. And I want to show you how to, to achieve this. So you can, when you configure Spark, you can con uh, have to tell the system how much compute resources should be available to you. And figuring these parameters out uh, can be tricky. Here in the user interface, you no longer see anything because we shut it down already. So let's go back to... As already mentioned before, um, there are downsides when using these interpreted languages. It will be slower when writing Java or Scala code in the Spark native programming languages.
But for example, recently in Python and for the new version of Spark, they will basically make user-defined functions faster. And maybe this will happen at some point for R as well. And also, this is not the whole picture, the uh, performance of the execution. You need to think about the development or developer performance as well and productivity. Um, there might be some really cool and fancy models in R, and porting these over could be a huge uh, amount of work. Um, as I said before, layered exceptions might make your life hard when debugging. And the deployment of a local cluster could be problematic if your cluster admin does not fancy installing R. But besides that, the JVM has a huge library. You will not be able to use all of these libraries in uh, Spark when connecting to it through R, because Sparkly R or Sparker can only use basically the SQL API of Spark. And Streaming data is something people are talking about quite a lot recently. But um, besides this demo you see down here, streaming data is not something one would recommend to do in R. Because for streaming data, you would probably, or you should have decent windowing capabilities or event time handling built in. Spark offers these, but not in the R API. So this is currently not advisable to use. Um, I want to conclude the talk now, and I'm looking forward to some questions. Mm. No one. I, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah, I so, start so short. <laughs> sh shoot uh, on. This, this, you, in, in the demo, you showed that there's a possibility to send a user-generated, uh, user-defined function. Does uh, something apply? From something from the apply family with the Spark pretended, I, I believe it was, right? Yeah, you see it right here. Yes, exactly. If I use some some global object, kind of, um, is that go going to be to be copied? It's no. Going to be copied to from sorry, from the global environment here. So, um, for example, whatever the the, the E is from the global environment, is it going to be copied to each single worker? So first of all, this is a closure. And the closure will be serialized. Anything outside this function will not be available and throw an error. And besides that, um, you see the underscore here. In R, people often use the dot to reference attributes of a class. This is not so in, in other languages like Java. And Spark will automatically convert these. But when you basically want to refer them to the way you refer to them originally in R, it will break because they are named now so in a different way. Uh, no, Spark will rename them for you, but anything you want to have available, it needs to be explicit in the closure. Thank you. Yeah? Um, so, the great thing about uh, Deployer and the data frames, what I use it for, is that you um, can do these list columns. So, you could um, store, like, for example, in a cell, you could store a whole data frame yeah. as such, or could store any object, like a a whole linear model, and what you can do is you can, uh, for example, the usual data set is the GetMinder data set, which, where you can fit multiple models to different countries, for example. Um, so what, what you did, the interesting part is the room, the type yes. room. Um, could you like pass anything else back? Could I get, for example, a whole linear model back so and analyze it afterwards? The, the thing is, no, you can't. Oh. Spark is um, basically distributed, let's say, database in some way, and it allows you to access data by columns and rows. And you can actually have objects in these rows if you're using not the R API, but for this to work, you need to provide it in a, in a tabular format. Mm -hmm. okay. And this is why we use Bloom here. So the way of, of uh, providing streaming um, handling in, in R? Um, in general, this is a quite new topic. So it only was 
where we recently put it into the main part of Spark via the structured streams to allow streaming on data frames. And uh, probably at some point it will be ported to be supported in the R API. But currently, I've heard that there are problems with RStudio on data frames which basically change their content over time. So it will requi require additional changes in the tooling of the whole R environment. Okay, so there is another, another yeah. option for us. I can just yeah. <coughs> Yeah? Is there any benefits or any performance gaining using Spark in, a, in one server only? Because, for example, in, in the web page of Spark, they say it really speeds up data processing even if used on one server, but in my experience, it was not like that. I mean, usually it depends. So, for example, if you're using explicit parallelization already in your R code, and you basically then run that again parallelized via Spark, this will not work. And if you use the single threaded R code, this will be probably faster than the single threaded R code. But to some point there will, might be limitations if you're already using like only the uh, fast C or Fortran APIs of R, then adding the JVM on top might not help a lot. But this depends on the case. Any further questions? Does this also work with the engine? which is kind of a Java implementation of R. And then if it's Spark is also Java, it's maybe easier. I don't know. So the first thing is Rangin. It does not support all, all R packages, right? So you might come across some R packages using fancy native C code and dependencies. And this is a problem you will face quite often. Um, when Rangin won't help you in the first place. But coming back to your question, um, if you do not there are two perspectives how to start. One is as a developer who already knows Java, this might be a fit for you to do it like that. But a lot of the people are business analysts who know a little bit of SQL and some a little bit more about R. For them it's easier to start with R. This is just a different way. And the Sparkly R makes it really easy to get started this way. And handles a lot of these problems which can occur on these local workers. And also, as shown here with the user-defined aggregate function, if you basically need to write that functions on yourself, it requires a lot more code than just these couple of lines. So it is, has also some uh, developer performance productivity impact here. Yeah? If you have a big uh, raw file, is it better to uh, load it directly in Spark or to prepare it first into a kind of Well, the thing is, you need to consider how often do you need to use that file, how big is it in the first place, and if it's really big, you usually want to process it in a distributed fashion, so Spark would be useful for that, and you should not basically use the copy to uh, command we're using here because that would not fit into your computer. But if you read it in a distributed fashion or need it once, you can use the CSV files That's just fine. For sure, it will be more efficient if they are pre-processed in a, in a compressed format, because then less I.O. happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you learn also Spark to combine the data from Hive, Cassandra, using the R implementation? So as long as all your adapters allow you to use the data frame API, so the SQL uh, API of Spark, it works just fine. And you can just load additional packages when starting up your Spark session. And this is something which is really nice about Spark. So just to clarify, so I can have all my data on, on the Spark cluster? I don't need to... Have well, Spark is not like a data store, but no, more I'm like a processing thing. But okay, but I mean like I can have my data sources, I have my local station and my, my data sources, I have somewhere in the other cluster, let's say Hive and Hadoop. Uh, then I can just use the Spark and disclosures which are using that I can use for accessing the data from these different data sources. Yeah. So I hope it's a single cluster, but yes, you can do it. Yeah. I have one, one, more, one possibly stupid question. You mentioned that obviously at, uh, on every worker uh, R needs to be installed, right? Yeah. Do I also need to handle all the packages that I have on my, my master node also have installed on the worker node? I so the thing is, 
if you use something like Sparklayer, it will automatically distribute the packages for you. Okay. Great. So you should not need to worry so much about it. Um, it depends where you want to install it and how you want to have your cluster set up, but any sane admin would not give you directly access to his cluster, so they will basically face a, um, something like Nox in between, and then you would need to install Spark Livy server to allow restful connections to, into your server in a controlled fashion over your the Nox proxy. And then it doesn't matter where it's installed, but you could install it on the edge node or wherever. So uh, you w basically, for on the edge node, you have would have uh, all the stuff installed to have direct access into the cluster. You would not need to have it installed there. Probably it might be recommended to not install it there to have have them cleaner. But it just depends on how you want to have it. For example, I know about traders who, who use data science as well. Yeah. Is it any way implemented in Spark? So Spark itself is just something based on the Java and JVM world, or basically it's written in Scala. But it, the R packages you, you are using can, if you go back to this slide here, basically instantiate a local R process. And anything you can do on this local R process here you can do it now distributed on multiple workers, mm -hmm. which is a nice thing, because then you can just distribute your R code and just have it compute faster on more data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> I was just wondering, um, you prefer using Spark ER, right? Yes. So. Um, um, do you? I, I know people using Spark R, right? Not Spark yeah. R, right? We work with people using Spark R. So, so could you? Do you, are you aware of the differences between both? Um, I'm aware a little bit of them. So, for example, if you want to do the streaming thing, mm -hmm. which I would not recommend, you would need to use Spark R mm -hmm. because it's currently the only uh, tooling which would offer that. Mm -hmm. uh, besides that, if you know Diply R, you should actually. It is highly recommended to stay in the tidy universe when using Spark, so Sparkler would be a natural fit. If you're not using Diply and use how to basically formulate questions in that grammar, it just depends on what you wanted to use. Okay. okay. But it doesn't matter. In terms of functionalities? Or well, like a couple of months ago, only Spark R would allow you to use UDFs or the users you yeah. find aggregate functions, mm -hmm. but this changed recently, so this limitations is no longer yeah. there. Right. 